Okay, I'm ready. We're rolling. Okay, um, this is an interview with Paul Forment uh, at the uh, DMNA headquarters, Latham, New York, February 12th, 2002. It's approximately 10:30 a.m. Uh, the interviewer is Michael Russert. Uh, first, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about your background. Where were you born and raised? Well, I was born and raised in Coles, New York. Uh, you say my background uh, before I went to the Navy? Or? Yes, before you went into oh, the Oh, well, uh, I enlisted when I was 17. Mm -hmm. Went right out of high school into, uh, into the Navy. What, what year was that? Uh, 1943. Okay. Um, <clears throat> why did you enlist at that time? Well, all my friends were going. And uh, my guidance counselor told me if I didn't graduate in three years, they were going to draft me. And I was taking a college entrance course at the time, and I was taking all the toughest subjects, and I found it a little bit more than I could handle. So I said, well, I'll go in, which I did. Okay. Um, so when Pearl Harbor happened, you were in high school. Yes. How did you hear about... It was a Sunday afternoon. I'll, I'll never forget it. It was uh, December 7th, and uh, uh, news came over the radio. That's what we had then, radio. We didn't have TV. And we all went outside, you know, and all our neighbors and everyone saying, well, you know, it, uh, finally we're in it, which we expected to be anyway. The war had been going on in Europe for quite some time. Mm -hmm. What was your own personal reaction to this? Well, that's, it's been a long time that, to remember my own personal reaction that, that, uh, uh, that I would probably be going in the service. Like uh, my brother, was, one of my brothers was already in. We were four brothers, we were all in the service. What branches of the service uh, were your brothers? Uh, my brother's three in the Army, and I was the only one in the Navy. Why did you pick the Navy? That <clears throat> seemed more glamorous to me. <laughs> At the time, there was a lot of movies on about the Navy, and, and uh, I remember when I was in an interviewed, I, I said I wanted to be a machine gunner on a PT boat. Now, if I had it to do over again, I would, I would be different. But uh, at the time, that's what I thought I wanted to do. Okay, well, where did you take your basic training? Samson. Mm -hmm. Samson, New York. Okay, and how, what were you trained to do? Uh, well, basic training, we were just trained to, to get in shape. I boxed gold and gloves while I was at Samson. And then, uh, uh, since I had asked to be a machine gunner in a PT boat, they, they sent me to a gunnery school in Newport, Rhode Island. And uh, from there, I was transferred to uh, Camp Bradford, Virginia, uh, for amphibious training, and was signed to a crew on an LST. So, after uh, after my training down there and assigned to the crew, we went to Boston to pick up the ship. The ship was just a haul then. We spent a couple of months in Boston. So Fargo this was it an LST. An LST, yes. Well, they worked 24 hours a day. We used to go over on the ship uh, even at nighttime and putting on supplies, getting it ready for shakedown crews. So was most of your service on an LST? Was all on an LST. Oh. After that, I, I, I spent my time on the LST until I uh, came back and was discharged. Mm -hmm. Were you the on the same LST? Or were yeah, you? it was the same one, yes. Mm -hmm. LST 926. Um, could you tell us about your experiences then, starting with the time was that on the LST order, order? Yes. Well, we went. Uh, we did our shakedown cruise. Went down the Atlantic coast. Well, we stopped in New York City, and we picked up a a smaller landing craft on our main deck, and then went down the the coast to uh, uh, Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, while we we're waiting to go through the canal. Those times, you had to spend a couple of weeks. You get down there before you could go through the canal. It was that busy. It was one ship after another. So went up to after through the canal. We went up to uh, San Diego, then over to Pearl Harbor, where we picked up a, an outfit of uh, uh, black sea bees, and we took them to uh, Guam. We were all alone, and at those those times there was a lot of uh, uh, sub activity. Warning of sub. We traveled alone, which was unusual, and. Uh, we dropped them off, and that night we pulled out, and the Japs bombed the hell out of Guam that night. From Guam, we went on down to Manus, 
and then down to New Guinea. From New Guinea went down through the Salomons down to uh, Guadalcanal. That was as far as south we got, Guadalcanal. Guadalcanal, by the way, uh, I had a first cousin who was killed at Guadalcanal, has my same name. They named a destroyer escort after him, the same as the one that's here in Albany. So we came up through Guadalcanal to uh, Bougainville. We picked up a Sherman tank outfit on Bougainville, and we went and made the uh, D-Day invasions at Luzon and uh, the Philippines. Uh, Could we, you describe your well, reactions to that? That was your first time in combat? Well, the first time, before we made the invasion, we're going up uh, through the Straits uh, uh, in the Philippines, and we'd been under attack right along ever since we had left uh, uh, Guam. There was nightly attacks, mm -hmm. but uh, then we started traveling in convoys, and uh, uh, there was a lot of flak thrown up. But uh, the first time we got a plane was uh, before the invasion in Luzon, and uh, this plane come right, they used to come out of the sun at night, come right at us. In fact, I could see him, and uh, I could see the pilot, and uh, his wing, uh, wing guns were going and uh, bouncing off my gun cap. I was the gun captain on the forward twin 40. And we got that, uh, that first plane, and uh, I got a call from, uh, I also had the con talker helm, and I got a call from the bridge and asked me why I didn't contra concentrate some of our fire on the second plane. I said, what second plane? We never saw the second plane. We're too excited with the first. So uh, the captain wanted to speak to the forward gunnery officer. So I turned around. He was crawling out from under my gun top. <laughs> so uh, I handed him my headset, and he turned around. And he asked me why I didn't concentrate some of my fire on that second plane. Well, needless to say, we never saw the second plane. But then we hit, uh, it was New Year's Day that we made our D-Day invasion in Luzon, Lingang Gulf. We hit the beach, and then uh, we pulled off the beach, and we, we laid in the, in the Gulf right under the, the guns of the uh, battleship California was firing over us all day long. And the Japanese were coming out in small uh, speedboats. They had these small uh, speedboats, the, the front of them were loaded with TNT, and they would crash into the side of the ship. Uh, one came up between our sister ship and our, and our ship and crashed into the uh, shaft alley, and uh, all the men down in the uh, engine room were drowned in that ship. They were also coming out and swimming under boxes, and they'd will, they would throw grenades up in the gun, gun tubs, or they would climb, uh, climb up the anchor chains. So every man on the ship was issued a, uh, a weapon if he didn't have one. Uh, I had a Thompson submachine gun, and uh, everyone had a weapon. If uh, anything floated around the ship, you immediately uh, fired on it. So that uh, outfit of Sherman tanks we brought into uh, Lin Gang Gulf went on down to Manila, and most of the fellows that we found out later that uh, we got real friendly with uh, uh, lost our lives at uh, uh, the Battle of Manila. Now that's pretty much on uh, Lin Gay and Gulf. Uh, from there, that was, uh, uh, I said it was, uh, uh, oh, uh, J uh, New Year's Day, January 1st, we made that D-Day invasion. And then we went on over uh, to rendezvous in I Iniwita, to go for the invasions of uh, Okinawa. And that convoy that we were in were literally thousands of ships, as far as, as, far as the eye could see, were all ships. And uh, I remember that uh, we had a lot of sub-activity one night while uh, we were standing gun watch, which we would, uh, were always uh, on the guns, but at, at uh, sunrise and sunset, uh, the gun was cocked, we were ready to fire because uh, that's when most of the attacks came on. And we got warning there was sub-activity, and a subsurface between our, our ship and another ship, one of the fellas thought it was a whale, <laughs> and that convoy opened up, and those sub-chasers came down in between, it was something to see, boy, they were right on that sub, he didn't stand a chance. So then we went on to the invasion of uh, Okinawa, we hit the beach D-Day in Okinawa, and uh, 
there was a lot of uh, uh, plane activity and one of one of our spotter planes came in low over us and uh, uh, chief gunner's mate on a machine gun up forward he gunned down one of our spotter planes uh, but it was hard to know which plane was uh, was ours or theirs so but uh, it was an unfortunate thing a lot of activity when we hit the beach at Okinawa and then that week uh, uh, we pulled out into a, a convoy and left Okinawa a typhoon hit within a couple of weeks at Buckner Bay and uh, a couple of our sister ships were up on the reef when we got back we spent about oh that's better than a month riding out that typhoon and uh, when we got back, as I say, these they were these ships were on the reefs. From then, we we started running milk runs uh, between Saipan and Tinian to Okinawa. What do you mean by milk runs? Milk runs. Well, in other words, before we were making D-Day invasions. Well, uh, Okinawa was uh, uh, pretty much uh, the decisive battle out in the Pacific, and. Uh, uh, we made, well, we made one more uh, D-Day invasion, Aishima. We hit Aishima, and that was our third invasion. But from then, uh, we'd run these milk runs, for, uh, bringing in supplies and ammunition uh, from uh, Saipan and Tinian, which was our main bomber, our bo uh, bomber base uh, that they were bombing Tokyo. I used to watch them all day long, the B-29s would take off uh, to go out in their bombing missions to Tokyo, and all the next day they'd be coming back and well it wasn't a day went by you didn't see one drop in the bay because they were coming back with a shot up wing or something like that we used to go over to the airfield and they'd let us take a ride and go up in the b-29 like one time i was in the <laughs> in the bombers right in the nose of the uh, b-29 in the bomber seat and the plane had just gotten a new wing and the pilot took it up and went into a nosedive. That was quite a, quite a thrill looking at the ocean when you're going down straight down. <laughs> so I did that a couple of times, but that was enough of that. Did you ever fly a mission in one of them? Or were they no, just, no, uh, no. It was just, uh, it just took us up when they, when they were, uh, after they had repaired the plane. And they, if you wanted a ride, they'd take you up for a ride, you know. So then from, uh, from there we went to, uh, on our way back, we were on our way back to uh, Pearl Harbor to pick up an outfit of Marines to hit uh, uh, Tokyo proper and uh, when they dropped the atomic bomb. And of course that was, that was pretty much, uh, well it was the end of the war as far as uh, uh, Pacific was concerned. What was your reaction hearing about the... Oh, very relieved because uh, Tokyo Rose was coming on daily, you know, saying how, uh, oh, uh, you fellas, you know, we're, we're going to throw everything we got at you. And they said they, they had so many thousand planes left that uh, when we hit the beach on D-Day in, uh, in Tokyo proper, it wasn't going to be any piece of cake. So, but then... Uh, I didn't get back right away. They named our ship the military, a military government ship, and we went around to islands that were bypassed during the war. And uh, could you explain that uh, what what it means to bypass islands? What would well, there were uh, there were so many islands uh, out in the Pacific. It wasn't necessary to, to hit every island. If you just by, bypassed them and uh, and took over that island, the others were just shut off. And uh, the Japanese archipelago. Uh, uh, Really, uh, Okinawa was the key. That was the large one. Uh, we went to uh, I, uh, oh, what? Well, think of a uh, couple of uh, smaller islands in that archipelago that uh, uh, we couldn't even get into with an LST, which we normally hit the beach and, and were able to open our bow doors and drop the ramp. Uh, these guys, the the coral reefs were so so uh, massive that we had an amphibious duck aboard and we would go ashore with on a duck and climb right up on the coral reef and uh, we removed the, took the arms away, set up government and it was pretty much a peaceful thing. 
You never had any resistance from? No, no resistance at all. Did you have anyone with you that spoke Japanese? How oh yes, we, we, we took on a, a military government uh, group, which uh, there were interpreters and lawyers and everything, everyone that was necessary to set up, uh, to do the job that had to be done. And I used to go ashore on many of these uh, parties. Uh, uh, I don't remember exactly why, I, I, whether it was my choice or whether uh, uh, it was a, a duty I had to perform at the time. So. How long did you uh, do this, uh, act as a government uh, ship? Well, let's see. That would be at least six months or maybe, maybe more, yeah, probably along that time. And then uh, our ship went, finally did, we did head back, stopped at Pearl Harbor again on the way back. We had been, uh, made a couple of stops in Pearl Harbor during the war uh, out for uh, supplies. And uh, went back and the uh, ship was going to be decommissioned in San Francisco. And I, was, I went on back from San Francisco to Lido Beach in, uh, in New York for discharge. Now, when were you discharged? Um, May, let's see, May, was it May 18th? I think I got my card here. Yes, 18th of May, 1946. Okay, how did you feel when you arrived back home? <laughs> oh, <laughs> well. I told you I was 17 when I enlisted. I wasn't quite uh, uh, 20 yet when I was discharged. I spent a little over two and a half years, most of it out in the Pacific. Uh, it, uh, it was probably one of the greatest feelings of my life to get back home. Uh, it was no, uh, not, a, not what you'd call enjoyable, uh, but it was an experience I'm glad I had and I wouldn't want to do it again. How do you think the war changed your life? Well, it took a lot of steam out of me at the time. Uh, I can remember when I was uh, when I was in high school. I had lots of ambition and and uh, lots of things I wanted to do. When I come back, I I had a lot of the steam taken out of me. I'd say it, it took a couple of years for me to to get back where uh, uh, I pretty much got over to the way it was out there. Mm -hmm. What um, what happened to you when you returned? Uh, your education? Did you continue your education? Well, I, yes, I, uh, I went back to high school and uh, that didn't work too well either. So then I went to the Veterans Vocational School in, in Troy and uh, took machine design. And uh, I got a job in the arsenal. I was able to work my way up to a, 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 a production planning supervisor, which was a good, good job. I had a Good job in the arsenal. I see the arsenal treated me good. Mm -hmm. Do you belong to any veterans groups, or do you go? Uh, to any I'm a life member or? of the DAV. Uh, I belonged. I uh, tried a couple of veterans groups, but I found that I wasn't too much of a joiner. And uh, but I, uh, I maintain. As I say, I'm a life member in the DAV, and uh, because I, I felt as though uh, I should belong to something, uh, even though I didn't. Uh, I went to meetings for maybe a couple of years and uh, I dropped out of it. Do you go to any of the reunions? Are you in contact with any of your crewmates? That's an unfortunate thing, you know. I, I get that DAV magazine every month and uh, I look for uh, reunions of my ship. I never had any. Uh, we didn't have a, a very close relationship between uh, uh, the officers and the crew. It's un unfortunate, but uh, uh, that's the way it was. And I remember when we crossed the equator, uh, it was a real, a real battle between uh, the officers and the crew. Our skipper was a Mustang that came up through the ranks, and uh, he didn't like his officers, and they didn't like him, and uh, we were more or less caught in the middle. And he sat out there on the bridge all day long, when that, from sunrise till sunset, while that uh, uh, celebration, whatever you would call it, when we were across the equator, and uh, uh, it left a lot of bad feelings then. Some of the officers took it real bad. Uh, they weren't, they figured they weren't treated right or whatever. So, uh, 
But they all got treated the same. See, that was the thing about crossing the equator. If you hadn't been across before, officers or crewmen didn't make any difference. You, got, uh, you went through the same treatment. And I remember our executive officer, he had a, one of those small mustaches like uh, Hitler had, you know. <laughs> Something like, maybe a little smaller than yours. But he was quite proud of it. And uh, they shaved half of it off. I mean, he went around the ship for, oh, at least a couple of weeks or more with just half a tash before he shaved the rest of it off. And so, but it was, a, it was an experience, World War II. All well, my brothers came back too. We all came back alive. We're very fortunate. No one was killed on our, my ship. Uh, uh, that was fortunate too. You said that uh, one of the first things you did was to take a Black Seabees group. Oh yeah. What well, was uh, the relation between the sailors and? Oh, we had a couple of black uh, men aboard our ship. Uh, mm -hmm. At that time, the Navy, they, they were messmen. Uh, yes. Uh, I, uh, one shared, I, I had the, we had bunks three high, and uh, I had the bottom bunk, and uh, one of the messmen had the bunk above me. We got along fine. Uh, no, I never, uh, I never saw any, any problems between, uh, uh, any racial problems between uh, the blacks and the, and, uh, and the whites. I don't know how racial problems happen. I, I worked in the arsenal, and uh, we had blacks in the arsenal and black supervisors, and there never any problems. Mm -hmm. How do you think, uh, I've read about LSTs and how they handled in high seas, what your reaction to that? They were like a cork, you know. Uh, we rode out, oh, maybe three typhoons when we were out there in the Pacific, and they're worse than the invasions. Uh, Typhoons are the scariest thing I ever went through. The waves are like mountains, and uh, uh, we had a stand gun watch even even during the, the typhoon. We were out on the on the bow. As I was said, I was a gun captain on the forward twin forty, and uh, uh, we would stand gun watch, uh, and uh, the ship would go up a wave like this, and you'd climb it, and actually climb the wave, and then the bow of the ship would go out over the wave, and you're hanging out over and looking down like into a valley, until you got so far over, and then the ship would go down, boom, 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 down into the valley and up again. You'd walk along the, the deck in the cruise quarters, and the decks actually waved like that when you were walking along them. You wondered if the ship was going to hold together. Yeah, and if uh, that first typhoon, uh, uh, that we uh, we were in after uh, the invasion of uh, Okinawa, we started out with about 45 ships, and when when it was over and we got back, there was only um, about 27 ships left. Weren't that they went down, but if they couldn't stay with the convoy, they they just left them, because you had to maintain a certain amount of headway to to uh, keep from floundering. Do you think there's anything you would like to add? Mm, I suppose there's things that I would I would think of uh, later, and I, I remember. You know, it's it's been over 50 years now. Can you imagine that? Over 50 years. <laughs> it seems like yesterday. But uh, some of the things I could probably add, uh, I couldn't add what my wife was sitting down the other end of the table. <laughs> So, uh, no, they, they would probably mostly be personal things, you know, fellas and I, I was young and single then when we used to go on leave. And, uh, Where were some of the places that you went on leave, mostly Pearl Harbor? Or oh, were there other Pearl Harbor, well, of course, San Diego, we went over to Tijuana, right across the border at the time. Uh, but uh, after Pearl Harbor, there wasn't much place, many places to go oh. then. Uh, uh, in fact, it, there was, wasn't any. I, I can remember uh, Okinawa. I used to run, uh, when we were the military government ship, uh, we used to be at the north end of Okinawa quite a bit. And uh, we had a, 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 a jeep and a small weapons carrier. And I used to take the, the jeep from the north end to the south end, which was Naha at the time. There was nothing left on, on Okinawa then. It was completely bombed out. 
And I can remember uh, coming around at, at, at dark at night and going around a little mountain road there that I used to take with that Jeep. It was quite dangerous up then. Uh, but uh, no, there were no liberties then. I'd say that uh, Pearl Harbor was it. In Pearl Harbor then, uh, uh, my wife and I went back to uh, uh, Hawaii on a vacation. And I couldn't believe the, the change. Uh, when I was there during the war, my Pearl Harbor was, was, was a, a, a huge naval base, and, and, and the harbor was always full of ships, besides the ones that, that had gone down that, st that stayed there. And there was nothing there. It was all, was all gone. And uh, the only thing was the, uh, the memorial for the battleship uh, Arizona. And we had taken one of these little cruise boats and the only thing coming out through the harbor was a, a, a submarine. It was a lone submarine coming out. And my God, I remember when we were there, it was just all the ships you could, you know, as far as you could see in there. You know, they packed them right in. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Bob, do you, do you have any questions? No. Mm. Okay, well, we'd like to thank you very much. Well, you're welcome. I, I hope, uh, I probably not, but in fact, I'd have got discharged sooner. I would have gone home on, on points, but because we were made in military government ship, I was frozen on it, and uh, I, I spent several more months than I had to out there. But, you know. Did you take any of the uh, Japanese soldiers that were on these islands back? Anywhere, or were they left on the islands? Uh, as far as I know, they were left on it. I don't remember bringing any uh, back aboard ship. We, no, we never had any prisoners aboard ship. Uh, I remember when on the way back, when we, uh, we stopped at uh, Iwo Jima, and uh, it was a thing, you know, we, as an LST, we were able to go right up on the beach. In fact, uh, when we got to Pearl Harbor, uh, uh, you know, we we went right up on the beach where uh, uh, Waikiki Beach is now, and uh, we stayed there about two weeks. Uh, and the only hotels there were uh, 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 oh, the, what was what's that pink hotel there, Alice? Uh, and the Navy took it Royal, over. Royal the, the, Royal something wasn't it? Uh, Royal Hawaiian. Royal Hawaiian. The Navy took it over then, and I used to go swimming a couple of, and on the beach there. And they had another one next door, the Outrigger. And the rest of that beach was just uh, any beach you'd find, open beach anywhere. And uh, we just opened the bow doors, dropped the ramp, and that was our spot there for a couple of weeks. And uh, but uh, coming back. Uh, and we stopped, I was saying, we stopped at Iwo Jima. In Iwo Jima, uh, we, there was no beach. It's just the top of a volcano. Mm -hmm. And we had to keep the engines going to butt the, the ship up against the, the, the shoreline. And uh, it was just, as I say, you stepped off. If you, if you stepped off the uh, bow ramp, you just went, dropped right down. There was, there was nothing there. And I, I can remember that uh, the center of the island was just one big cemetery. Uh, my God, it was, it was unbelievable and the thousands of men that, that were died there and were buried there and there. Um, so I had a lot of those islands and never had any desire to go back to them, <laughs> with the exception of maybe Pearl Harbor. Did you uh, go to mainland Japan at all? Uh, no, the, you say mainland Japan. Okinawa, of course, is a part of the Japanese mm -hmm. island. No, that, that's, the, that's the closest to uh, Tokyo. Okay. But uh, the islands that we bypassed around there, they were all part of the uh, uh, Japanese archipelago, too. Mm -hmm. and no, I never, never got to China. I got all the way down to uh, Guadalcanal, never got to Australia. It wasn't much of a, a liberty. After we left Pearl Harbor, it was not a liberty. Uh, it was strictly... Uh, uh, and from the time we got past Manus, uh, I'd say almost nightly, uh, we were under attack from Japanese planes. And uh, we were mostly traveling convoys that uh, threw up a lot of flak, constantly throwing up flak. And then we'd make smoke, and you'd watch for a, 
an opening in the smoke and you'd see a plane come over and fire through it. I think it was mostly you, you scared them off more than you hit them. You mentioned here that you shot down three yeah, planes. We, we got the... uh, credit for three planes. Our first one uh, I told you about when we were just we were coming up in the Straits of uh, of uh, of uh, Well, before we made the, the first D-Day invasion there, we got that first plane. And then we got uh, two planes uh, during the Battle of uh, Okinawa, during the invasion of Okinawa. They say we lost about 500 destroyers uh, around Okinawa at that time, and I, I believe it. Uh, the destroyers were out there. and. I used to see the planes come in, even though when they didn't come at us, they always crashed into usually looking for an aircraft carrier or, uh, or, or a, uh, a battle wagon, some big ship. It was going on all the time. And they, I never saw one come in and drop his bombs and that he didn't wind up crash, committing suicide crashing into the ship. Did you see any ships hit? Oh, yes. 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 As aircraft carriers were hit constantly. So a lot of our own planes come in to land on the aircraft, aircraft carriers and drop off before they uh, were able to land. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome.